society uh, thrives on competition and elimination in terms of the matter that we're all involved in and gives no credence, you see, to any other existence that we might be sharing. certainly that uh, on the basis of what experience I've had, that mankind is aggressive, primarily, genetically, instinctively. Uh, I think, with all due respect to Maddie, I think that her scale in time from the caveman to modern Western civilization is much too short a scale in time to have any material effects on what I imagine is the genetic origin of uh, aggressiveness. Uh, but to be more specific and to your point, I think that uh, our Western civilization uh, has been largely developed from a Judo-Christian philosophy, which of course uh, antedates our Western civilization or possibly is the beginning of it. And I think this ro these romantic attitudes which have evolved in the last two centuries have been predicated upon the wishful thinking of the Judeo-Christian theories and are not predicated upon a realistic understanding of man's biological or realistic aggressive nature. And since our standards of social organizations are predicated upon this romantic theory, they are bound to fail because they are not dealing with man realistically. Thus change must be predicated in the future if we are to survive as a race on a understanding of man himself and a reorganization of social structures to, con to comply with his innate nature. I, well, I would I'm, like to I'm assuming that this innate nature you talk about is uh, an innate aggressive well, yes. he said that, but I would like yeah. to correct a, a misunderstanding. I was saying that Western civilization is a caveman civilization. I was not indicating any change whatsoever uh, because the same brute force mentality you know, with which the caveman proceeds is what is currently dominating in the world through I this Western uh, stance. So I suggested that this is opposed to the kind of civilization, and I should use that word, the kind of humanity that uh, Mahatma Gandhi was speaking to when he said that we'd have to overcome brute force you know, if there is to be an extension of our species. We would agree with that. Uh, and I think that what you are doing is um, exhibiting a gross reluctance to view yourself as the primitive that you are, because Western man is hung up in a primitive kind of mentality. And not being able to vision any growth beyond where you currently are, you confuse nature with behavior. Now, we have demonstrated this aggressive innate behavior, but we have done this in a world where there have been other peoples who've not succumbed to it. For sure, they've not been able to evolve the material dominion that Western civilization speaks to, and maybe they don't even want to. I mean, it's my understanding from Eastern philosophies that they would rather everyone uh, seek to express, contain, project, radiate all there is of a spiritual kind of evolution than a material, technical, industrial, military, mechanical kind of manipulation of the environment. So I think the basic thing is whether this aggressiveness is behavior, uh, which is a result of some other things not operating, or whether it is the total of our nature. And I have a capacity beyond the active, passive aspects of what I do, the aggressive and inert aspects of what I do. I don't think that we've gotten over an initial hurdle. Uh, if I understand Bruce and his initial remarks, he said that most people in the field are in agreement that animals are based, have instincts, and the degree that they act instinctively may depend on their position in the scale of development, but 
then I think he went on to say that uh, you cannot observe or experiment with man sufficiently to make any definite conclusions. And it seems to me that you have to get over the hurdle of the jump from what you may know about animals to apply that to man. I'm not sure that simply because animals are necessarily instinctive that you can make that leap and say that uh, human beings are therefore also instinctively aggressive. Well, I'd like to speak to that. And <coughs> um, as I say, it has been uh, demonstrated uh, beyond question that in uh, many species of animals, uh, aggression is an instinctive, uh, built-in phenomena. Uh, as an example, an, a following experiment has been performed. A uh, male a stickleback, the male stickleback fish is a favorite for experimentation by people who study instinctive behavior because it happens to show certain stereotyped uh, patterns of threat and attack. For instance, it normally swims along horizontally, but its threat posture is to assume a vertical posture. Now, if and the egg of a male uh, stickleback is taken and the animal uh, uh, comes out of the egg, and from the time the egg is broken, he is kept in complete isolation. He never sees another fish, but he's allowed to mature. Then the first time, in his, if his aquarium then, then another aquarium with another male stickleback is brought next to his aquarium, the first time that other male stickleback uh, swims towards him, he shows the threat posture and starts to attack the male stickleback. This, I mean, this, this is an example yes. of a case where I think there's just no other explanation but that this uh, behavior is built in. Now, but it's not consistent throughout even the animal kingdom that there is uh, aggression or that there is even uh, what was previously discussed, a concept uh, or, a, or an instinct toward protecting territory, acquiring property, defending well, a space, and so on. This is not consistent throughout even the animal kingdom and the but it is lower, the higher yes. apes which are closer, uh, uh, as far as mammals are concerned, to human beings than any of the other animals, are innately not aggressive. They are not instinctively aggressive. But and in fact, uh, uh, chimpanzees are uh, uh, described by um, somebody like Robert Ardrey, who wrote The Territorial Imperative, as an evolutionary failure because they are not aggressive and don't fit his theory. That's correct. That's correct. But uh, Audrey says, or at least those, it, uh, and it should be clearly stated here that Audrey doesn't propose to be a scientist, but rather a reporter. And he, the work that he reports is based upon um, scientific uh, investigation by many different scientists. But uh, Raymond Dart, of course, in South Africa, uh, developed or discovered or identified the so called Tong skull, which is the as far as I know, uh, not being an expert in the field, is the, uh, the closest connection that we are today aware of between man and, the, and his primate past. And this primate past is somewhat below, I think, uh, in terms of Darwinian evolution, the chimpanzee and so forth. But the uh, theory that is propounded by the behavioralist is that in order to survive in a diminishing uh, climate of, of, of abundance, i.e. a jungle. The jungle in Africa where we, mankind, originated uh, was declining and many of the uh, apes uh, had to get onto the onto terrain and thus uh, we developed a offshoot of the normal primates, primates and, and survived by our predatory uh, instincts by our ability to make weapons and so forth and by our ability to act in concert in herd in herd uh, relationships which of course is the basis uh, basis of, of altruism uh, and what we all call love today just to escalate this discussion a little bit um, well, then let's, let's escalate it uh, a little bit further in terms of this early development well, and what you call the herd instinct um, or the herd Mary, I would like yeah. to state that we're existing in a time, place thing, which is very critical uh, in terms of human beings. And I think that we ought to accept that all we know about human beings is past behavior and certainly nothing about nature uh, in its total uh, potential. I, I think we have to agree that we really can't define our nature because we're operating with less than 20% of our mental capacity. And if we're ever going to reflect and retrospect and conceptualize about ourselves to any useful degree, it's going to have to use some more of our mental capacities than we're currently using as man. But 
In terms of the crisis, I feel that the belief in a territorial imperative is a direct threat to my life. And this is why I, I take the time, you know, like 24 hours a day to speak to that in everything that I do. Because You're I believe. As a black now. I'm speaking as a human being. I get this experience out of being black in America today. Uh, I get this experience from living a culture of oppression, which is the other side of the territorial imperative. In other words, if you believe in the territorial imperative as a natural inclination of man, you not only have to validate the gang fights in our community as adequate preparation for young people who are going to enter that kind of an adulthood, but you also have to then say that there's such a thing as squatters' rights. And you see, as a civilization, you've never said this. So when you talk about territorial imperatives, just as you talk about aggression, you're simply viewing that half of the coin which has your picture on it. And what I'm about is that we should begin to look at man in some kind of potential wholeness, some kind of capacity for wholeness, or we can stop worrying about, you know, a beyond this point type of future. I agree with what you, you what we should do. I agree. Well, that that's we what have I want to us to do here today. All right, all right, so we're talking about survival, right? Also yeah, we've got to recognize, though, what man is. Well, I've recognized that, you know, I, you see, am a creature of a much higher imagination than one who would depict me in terms of a naturally aggressive creature. I am not that. Now, if that's your species, why don't we get to defining, you know, which species is evolving to what level and which would be better? Now, I believe, you know, that you have the capacity to evolve to, to a higher level of reality than, than brute force. I admit that masculine domination in Western civilization has reduced us to a brute force, you know, nation and civilization. I'm suggesting that now's the time to, you know, redirect some of that authoritarianism and become a little more authentic to the kind of beings that we can become. Well, we agree on that point, but I don't agree on the, I agree on your objectives totally, but I certainly don't agree on the rationale with, to which you arrive at the objectives. Well, then let's just consider the vision and the objectives, you know, is that a valid place to be headed, and if so, how of do course. we get there? And well, my, my main concern is to see in what way, or to uh, dream, to imagine, to, to, to try and think of some way through which with an, with, a, with an understanding of human nature, through which, with an understanding of human nature, through which we can redirectionize well, I, our society. I'm suggesting, Lord, well, if you mean, wait a minute, that, that if about. you have territorial imperative, then you have to allow squatters' rights, which well, means why? that it's you have to. It's not a question of allowing, the they same are. Thing. They All right, are. There is yes, one but just because you have, just because exactly if a man is basically aggressive, thing. it doesn't mean that if a man has, as I believe, basically built-in aggressive impulses, that doesn't mean, therefore, that war is right, I or that killing is right, or that the territorial I imperative said, is right. I said that if you allow that territorial imperative is a natural thing, yes. then you have to allow that squatters' rights is equally natural. We agree, it is. So then, so then why don't we right now begin to decolonize our ghettos so that the equality that we seek becomes meaningful. We uh, are not in a position, as black people in America, to live out the uh, so-called affluent abundance that you're talking about. All right, then let us decolonize and let us have squatters' rights where we are. Well, well wait a minute. And I'd like I mean, to, even now, though hang on. I'd like to relate very... this, Lord, uh, <laughs> to um, something that we did discuss a little bit earlier, because the um, man is the only living creature that has developed religious concepts, that has developed other concepts which transcend biology. And I'd like to know how this squares with the religious uh, beliefs. Well, Judah, at perhaps the risk you'd like of, to At the risk of this. being repetitious for a minute, uh, I agree with Lloyd that to do or to achieve the goals that Maddie wants to achieve, you have to first have an understanding of man. But I get the impression Lloyd feels he has that in terms of his acceptance of the territorial imperative, but I still don't feel I've gotten an answer to what evidence you bring to bear to sustain your initial assumption about an understanding of man. Because my understanding of man on the basis of a religious background is quite different. I come Would from a tradition in which man is, is, is essentially conceived as, as neutral, that he has a lot of uh, potentialities in various directions. Right. In the Hebraic tradition, we use the word yetzer, which means an inclination, and he has a good inclination and a bad inclination, mm -hmm. which are in balance. Right. And that it's up to man at that point then to do as he sees fit with those inclinations, either to reduce his evil aggressiveness, if you want to use it in those terms, or to strengthen the good in him. But you start from a different assumption, which I still don't see the evidence for. 
Let me, I, I'd like to uh, in, interpose yes. if I might, because I didn't get a chance really to uh, follow up a little more on the, the evidence that I wanted to uh, talk about uh, very briefly. I talked about this one species of fish, of course, in which it's been proven that this pr uh, particular kind of aggressive behavior is innate. Well, the, the main point I'd like to make, though, is that we see that the majority of the species uh, which have been studied do show aggressive behavior. And uh, in many of these, uh, there have been elegant experiments performed proving that this is innate. In many others, the, the, the elegant experiments haven't been performed, but the behavior uh, being highly stereotyped, that's one, one of the hallmarks of instinctive behavior, that it's very stereotyped. Every animal does it in almost the same way. In and, response and to the same in stimuli. The, in response to the same stimuli. Which I'd that, like to come back and, to that. All right, but the major point that I want to make is that in general, that if we see a phenomena throughout a wide range of species, that it's then unlikely that there's going to be one species that doesn't have uh, any of this characteristic. And as now Lloyd was saying, is the, the, uh, the prob there probably has been little genetic change since Cro-Magnon man, probably genetically, we're basically the same. And he was, the early men were probably social hunting primates. By the way, uh, and I'd like, well, to, I'd like to say that, that the chimpanzee, by the way, is an aggressive animal. There is a pecking order in chimpanzee groups. And they are uh, I, aggressive. And other, other uh, if, social if, primates in general are aggressive. And man is a, a social primate. But the primate. term social in itself connotes cooperation. Right. It connotes oh, that, it doesn't. It connotes to say the antithesis an, like, To say that there's aggression. aggression doesn't say that there isn't cooperation also. And that's another and that point that I want to make. And this has been the mainstream of, the, of human development. It has been the cooperative periods that have enabled the, the next stage of, of growth to develop. Now, yes, aggressive, uh, total aggressiveness would have had the small populations wiping each other out long before. Well, that's we wouldn't a even major point that needs to be made is right. that aggression in other species is very adaptive. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it has an adaptive value. Aggression in other species tends to do a variety of things, among which probably the most important are, number one, to spread the animals out so that they all have, they, they tend uh, to to uh, have, enough space. have a territory of their own. They have enough space, therefore that's, they, ha they have enough, yeah, but they have Bruce, enough food. Uh, but when you me, describe, just, just let me finish. Well, wait a I'd like to go back to something you said, and I'm trying to wait before I lose it. Mm -hmm. uh, something about the numbers of members of a species exhibiting something, therefore. But you see, you've overlooked the millions of people who've accepted a passive existence in the many, you know, uh, Eastern right. Asia. Well, I haven't what gotten have to talking you? to people. About, saying, I haven't gotten to talking no, about people yet. But I'm saying so. Well, this species, man, it. doesn't fit in with that generality. I mean, you know, it, it, it has some other factor operating yeah. over and above the factor you're describing. And I'm saying it's all right to describe that, but I think we should be getting those well, factors just, which man has. Well, well, just Maddie. let me finish though uh, this uh, 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 about uh, the the uh, <laughs> that these, as I say, animals in general and the social primates uh, included show uh, the, uh, these uh, aggressive patterns of behavior. And uh, therefore, I think it is, as I say, it's unlikely that man is different. Now, the thing well, about man, man is already the, different the by about, having developed language. Yeah, the thing, well, the main difference in man is that man is the only mass killer of his own species. Aggression in other animals uh, between other animals, between the members of the same species. Mm -hmm. Now, we said that we're eliminating now predator-prey relationships. Mm -hmm. Rarely, almost never results in killing, and rarely even results in bloodshed. Well, what is the reason for this, given your premise? What, how do you explain that Because man is evolutionary, a evolutionary, well, evolutionary mechanisms have, uh, the, the other animals have had time so mm -hmm. that they have evolved, when, when uh, evolved, oh, so and they have certain rules for the is, game. If this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say this mass killing is a cultural phenomenon of Western civilization, and you just can't continue to apply it I to mankind. I disagree with that you, you absolutely just can't fundamentally, do that Maddie. Well, Western I civilization is the only civilization in which there's been mass killing? No, no, That's I'm saying wrong. this characteristic that you're describing is a cultural phenomenon that I say is peculiar to Western civilization because it has not operated to that extent with all civilizations. I disagree. What kind I of think cultural it has. phenomenon, Pardon. Lloyd, could you foresee our moving toward or uh, trying to develop that will move beyond this? Well, I, I'd like to answer that, but I want to I answer directly to Maddie because I think it's a very important point. 
I do not think at the level we're discussing here that racism or nationality has the slightest bearing on the discussion. We're talking about homo sapiens, <coughs> and as far as I know, there, according to scientists, there is no difference, no significant difference between the mongoloid, the negroid, the Caucasian races in terms of their homo sapiens. I understand sapienity. the point I'm getting at is that you're using Western recorded history for your evidence. No, I'm not. I'm well, reading this, the this, these are the, the things, Japanese, the Navajo. The Chinese, no, these are the things the, uh, that have been described here in this conversation as evidence. Only possibly because we're more familiar with them. But well, I'm, I'm saying then just mm -hmm. limit what your conclusions refer to to the character that you're getting your evidence from, and that's Western man. We're saying, now, unless you want to go into some other civilizations and indicate you know, the, the kind of evidence that supports what you clearly are all about in Western civilization. I maintain that the Eastern civilizations of India or China or whichever you'd like to pick is just as aggressive as ours, as the Western civilization. But they are considerably more passive than yours. You see, what I'm trying to get at is that man has, as Jude said, several, you know, he's a whole, you know, he In the days seeks, of Genghis Khan, he you seeks think that the mankind, were, mankind okay from now. the beginning, uh, has had some balance of capacities. And the behavior that he chooses, I say, should be aimed at balance at higher levels, whereas the behavior that Western man is choosing is a static thing at a brute force level. And so it's not a quest or a search. It's a domination that this Western man is about. And that's why you come out with aggression always on top, because that's the value. And the Chinese are not aggressive today. I'm not going to get into that because guard. the Chinese have certain characteristics today in common with Western civilization, which is why well, it's becoming very critical. The territorial imperative all right, what is exactly have characteristics yeah. in, in common with Western. Uh, I don't want to get into but that no, debate either. either. On, you have to. No, I want to say you are segregating the Western man, and I say no, no, there's no, no difference saying, between Western I'm man saying and that any the other man. You've brought to this uh, conversation is irrelevant. limited uh, to Western man, and therefore right, your conclusions I'm, must be. In reference well, to Western what's the I'd evidence like to say, then from too, that, that um, we're, we're, uh, we're talking about a behavior. And, That's right. And uh, we're talking about behavior interchangeably with something that is considered to be innate. That's right. Uh, you, we are assuming then that the, what we see as the behavior Can of be human innate. beings right That's now right. is, is uh, being called innate when actually all that we can measure is behavior as far as human beings are concerned. And then we have to look to see how this behavior arose and how it developed, whether it was provoked. And right. certainly aggression in response to provoked situations uh, in, in defense, in, in, in search of food, in search of the necessities of life uh, is behavior which we can see uh, evidence of around us. But to imply and to insist that this is instinctive simply because um, it is there. It seems to me to beg the question. It also denies the, the uh, concepts well, of the well, Judah. I'd like right. to hear what Judah thinks on this. Used the if all man throughout all history, throughout all races, behaves in the same pattern, I don't see how you could deny that. There's a diversity of pattern. You're denying the diversity. You are, from, <laughs> you are selecting from, you are selecting, and your theory that you expound is selecting from within the diversity of behavior even within these borders between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean, the Hopi Indians uh, have a non-aggressive culture, a non-aggressive uh, approach, a cooperative approach, which is certainly a part of the whole human diversity. This theory and this concept is sort of self-fulfilling prophecy because it denies that end of the diversity. And as I, I'd like to Well, Matty just used an expression a minute ago forms. about man as a whole. And I wanted to mm -hmm. relate that some, back to something yeah, Bruce had said. You say that if uh, most of animal life exhibits the concept of, of uh, instinct, mm -hmm. that it's uh, most probable that man would not be an exception to that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm raising the old bugaboo of religion and science. Mm -hmm. I hope not. But it seems mm -hmm. to me that leaves out of the equation the possibility that man is something greater than the sum of his genetic makeup or his muscular makeup or his nervous system and so on, which I'm not willing to grant. And that mm -hmm. I, I can conceive because of my religious background that man not necessarily follow the pattern of the rest of the animal kingdom and that it is conceivable that one species could be different and not follow the same pattern. And it's not mm -hmm. so much different, but that he has internalized the characteristics of the lower order, but he has capacities for higher orders that oh, when we paralyze him psychologically and through all of our 
so-called civilizations, when we paralyze them at the brute force level, which is what might makes right and territorial imperative translates into, we inhibit you know, mm. his potential for growth, mm -hmm. for using those faculties of conceptualization and visualization, planning, mm -hmm. all of those faculties that the other species do not have. And we know we have, I know I have these capacities. Well, and we also have the capacity for making moral choices, and we have to ask in view of this we can visualize debate a model on what and basis we can to make it. these moral choices on the basis of an innate uh, evil or bad or, or aggressive or hostile nature of man or on the basis of the diversity potential. of human potential. And I think well, um, we've got to ask, what are the responsibilities of human beings to also, each other and the responsibilities of the religions? We can also society. look at the fact that, as I've said, and I think it's interesting here that the aggression here, the, it's always, it's equated as being evil, bad, and so forth. And yet other species have, as I said, and other species, adaptation, uh, uh, aggressiveness is adaptive. And I think that man, can also uh, channel his aggressive in instincts in adaptive ways. A kind of cooperative And uh, just as at one time, uh, to deny, just as at one time uh, in various societies and among various religions and so forth, there was an attempt to deny the sexuality of people, especially of women, uh, this didn't do any good. Uh, it's there, and you've got to deal with it. And I feel that this is Bruce, exactly the same. Can you, uh, can you be so adaptive as to completely change the object of the aggression? Well, yeah, yes. Uh, um, certainly now, for instance, for instance, in uh, in animal studies, if uh, if in a in it's been shown in certain species that if the for one thing that the uh, uh, aggressiveness is directly correlated to the level of male sex hormone. And as this level of male sex hormone builds up, there is more and more uh, aggressive attacks. And if the animal doesn't have uh, the object of choice to attack, which would be another male of its own species, then it'll start attacking other things. And eventually, maybe even will attack stuffed dummies and so forth. But uh, then your, your original definition of aggression, I, I'm trying to relate this, your original definition of aggression as uh, within a species. Mm -hmm. Uh, then seems also not to apply to man <laughs> in the same sense because uh, if, you, if you're going to talk about uh, attacking something other than each other, how do you uh, see... If you change the, if yeah, you change how do, the if object, change the no object how do you the see our changing yes. the object now of uh, what I would consider to be learned aggressive behavior? Yes. Uh. Well, yeah. now, if we're going to start uh, to on uh, possible solutions, I think no, I would think regardless of whether or not the, and, and I must make my position clear, you know, that I'm not saying that, uh, that uh, aggression is, that we have any proof that man is innately ag aggressive. I think we have suggestive I'm evidence. We have uh, I have never said, I have never yeah. said that we have, oh, any, okay. I, and I've um, also said that the, the kinds of experiments you'd have to perform to prove it one way or another can't be performed. Then you admit that it may not be so. But Bruce, oh, I would like right. you to get, yeah. get you to see that the kind of mm -hmm. observations you can make about mm -hmm. some human behavior is sufficient evidence, you it's see, that man that. Mm -hmm. has as much passive capacity as he has aggressive capacity. Well, capacity so uh, it gets back, well, not only passive, it gets but, back but to a wholeness and a selection of behavior in light of a situation. And I'm trying to say that our Western culture has mandated that the situation be territorial imperative so that we have been conditioned through every kind of learning process, formal and informal, to a material, mechanical kind of definition of our world and ourselves, so that we have uh, reduced uh, ourselves uh, to clay and we function so that we are merely mm -hmm. an exercise in clay. And I'm saying mm -hmm. that we are doing that by choice and mm -hmm. that as an oppressed person, I can see the choices because I don't have the illusion, you see, mm -hmm. of being one with the clay because I can't identify to the extent that the so-called affluent can with the things and you know and the money mm -hmm. and the material so mm -hmm. i can look at the phenomena remove myself from it and seek mm -hmm. some other explanations of my nature mm -hmm. All right. and th therefore yeah. you know the whole mm -hmm. message to humanity out of this western nonsense you know ought mm -hmm. to be to reexamine who we are 
wouldn't yeah. the commandment well, I thou shalt not that. kill? We, we should examine, yeah. re examine and, and who we are. And what our purposes we must need be. Be. We need a great deal more knowledge about uh, who we are. So we but don't it's, know it's man's It's extremely nature. difficult to, go, <laughs> really? to come by. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I would think, think that the uh, commandment thou shalt not kill also implies that there is uh, a, a transcendence uh, and that there is a, a, a moral choice that can be made in terms of the whole, society. The whole Judeo-Christian philosophy, philosophy from the very beginning has been urging mankind to accept love as the greatest standard, uh, contrary to what Maddie says, although I agree with uh, in, in, in I an aspect. I haven't said anything contrary to that, Lord. All right. Uh, All right. But the, the, the rise of Western civilization or certainly civilization has been conditioned, or we have attempted, using our best brains and resources, we have attempted to try and urge love as the standard of performance since the Judeo-Christian philosophy started. And we have been remarkably unsuccessful. Because I, I would say agree. that you've done just the opposite. You have championed the rhetoric of love and the practice of kill or be killed. And this why is, is the draft necessary? This is precisely mm -hmm. why the message of the cross is now distorted right. mm -hmm. in the Christianity that we see around us. I this agree is precisely with that. why That's not the reason so why, many though. poor, oppressed people you know, are still suffering with a Jesus or waiting for a Lord. Uh, I would go along with you, but it's not the reason why. I agree that the that the philosophy is ineffective. Wait, wait, let me understand. The reason I said why people are still oppressed as they were 2,000 and 6,000 years ago is because the uh, speakers for the established religion have spoken to the religion but not have, have not behaved in keeping with the religion. I say this is the reason that we have an oppressed condition in humanity today and we sit on two sides of oppression. One the oppressor and one the oppressed and we're constantly maintaining that this is normal human behavior and I say that that's brute force animal behavior and it's indicative of how primitive we are and unless we visualize another way of life, you know, we remain brute animals. I agree with you. Well that's why Christianity totally. has lost, you know, the heart of the living Jesus or the heart of any spiritual reality. Okay, I agree with you. The only place where I disagree with you is when you say that other civilizations, such as the Eastern civilization, is different. No, I said there were evidences that man could live out his whole life in a passive, you know, attitude towards everything around him. And I mean, this has been demonstrated by me. The caste system in India, you see, it's accepted by some of the people that it victimizes. Yeah. Well, they've been conditioned one way, we've been conditioned another way. By I'm simply force. saying, I'm simply saying, let's limit our observations about behavior to those where we observe that behavior, and let's recognize that there are some men living with opposite kinds of behavior, and that, that's input. The fact that there are large numbers of men who can live passively. There aren't large input. numbers. I don't it's well, extremely yeah, rare right. to be no, able no, no. to find these I, groups. Well, no, no, this, this has been right, right, traditional right, for a lot of people. Right around well, us. I, I, because, because they believe, they believe to. no, no, they have certain philosophies, for instance, no. some of the uh, Eastern religions have this reincarnation where the caste to which you were born in yes. has a direct, you know, uh, relationship to some infinity which you're always in. It says in. it hasn't stopped the history of violent warfare uh, but in these I'm saying, But why is this is there, then you have to admit that Bruce. the two, you see, are as natural to man as one mm -hmm. as the other. One is as natural to man as the other. So that you can't call one the aggression, you know, his nature as contrasted with the other. His nature. So you have to say man mm -hmm. is naturally uh, capable of aggression or non-aggression, which capable. is not no, to make is, a definition. He is not uh, capable of non-aggression. Well, but I'd like to pick up what Bruce said into, in, in terms of warfare and, and ask why is it necessary to have such intensive training for soldiers in order to get them to go out and kill? Why is it necessary to draft people if this yeah. is innate and everybody's just waiting for the opportunity to go uh, uh, let blood? Um, be because, because, like well, because, sure. because I th think fear, fear in the face of threat is also, as it is in other animals, is also in an, an innate, mm -hmm. a built-in mechanism. Well, what and about I when agree the fully with, and, and one, of, one, of, one of the, one of the problems mm -hmm. Yes, of, of course. Men, 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 men do have to be. Men do have to be. To in kill. fact, in effect, you're threatened. You're told either you go kill the enemy or we'll kill you because, if, as the penalty for desertion during well, war why do is we being have shot. To do this if be this is so innate? Well, because men also are innately afraid. 
afraid of, of being killed and afraid of, uh, of uh, both these mechanisms mm -hmm. occur in, also in other species. And there's often uh, conflict situations uh, which arise when, the, when, the, when, the, when, the, when two, these two mechanisms are elicited at the same time. But uh, I think this gives me a chance to bring up the, one of the points that about this short-circuiting. Evolution has produced in other animals an adaptive pattern of aggressi aggressive behavior. But in man, man, genetically, we're still probably basically the same as we were in, in very primitive days. But our culture and our technology has accelerated so fast that adaptive mechanisms have not uh, had, uh, there hasn't been time for adaptive mechanisms to develop, and especially the development of long-range long weapons. <laughs> weapons which permit killing at a distance. Because one of the things among, among most species of animals, the, the rules of the game, as I said, there's rarely bloodshed because usually early in the game, one animal gives up. Sometimes there's never even in, in any contact. In certain birds, there's displays of feathers. And then one bird says, man, you, you, you did it better than I did. It's you sort win. of a signal, and there really yeah, isn't any conflict. They know the rules of the game. Usually, and, yes. And there's uh, no there's, there are, uh, they have ways of signaling well, to each other, I give up aggressive. and I quit. But when you can shoot a man at a, a distance, then it's much easier. And I, to, to use an extreme example, I wonder how many of the airmen, how many pilots who can drop napalm on uh, a village, let's say, how many of those same men could go in and pour gasoline on a person and set that person afire? Uh, I, I think there are many less. Th these, uh, our weapons have, been a have an, uh, now have short-circuited some of the basic mechanisms which I still think we have for submission. For, uh, right. A person doesn't, 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 give a, doesn't have up. any chance to make mm -hmm. submission, submissive gestures. The ultimate, of course, is somebody sitting uh, a couple of thousand feet down on the ground with a button that he can push, Bruce which Bryan's can destroy uh, everyone. In the light everyone. of mm -hmm. kill or be killed, yes. what makes certain people choose to prefer to kill than to be killed since we know as clay we're going to be destroyed we you know we're born dying i mean you know we come into a very limited kind of life uh which has to culminate in the return of the clay and knowing that what is it that makes uh the choice preferable in the way you're talking about the airmen and all those people why is it that they would rather kill than to be killed knowing that they're going to die anyway well, well because you'd rather die. die later than now. That's, Why? You know. No, this is not true. There are some who, you know, would just go on and get it over with now. I mean, like, I don't feel that uh, Malcolm X wanted to die, mm -hmm. but I think he preferred to be killed, you see, than to kill or permit oh. innocent killing. He took a defensive posture, well, we do and have... he was killed. Dr. King, you know, this message, you know, 2,000 years ago, it was projected for the world. But these men over are rare. And over. These men are martyrs, and they're, they're very but rare. But they're not rare. They're only rare in the extent that history chooses to use them. But I know many people who will live by their ideals, you see, rather than live by someone else's dictates or commands. This is what's happening with the young people well, in this country today, and it has happened in other times. Maddie, I, think I, can not the I think the uh, I think there is a very clear answer to your question in what I would call Audreyism, uh, with all due respects to those people who contributed to it. Uh, I think all of us are tending, or at least the line of discussion here seems to be indicating a singular nature of man, i.e., that man is homogenetically, I guess, uh, aggressive. But I don't think Audrey says that. Or these people. He I don't think says it's phylogenetically aggressive. Yes, he does. Yeah, but he also <laughs> says too that that in order to survive, man had to learn to operate within a group, and and to uh, be prepared to give of himself, uh, up to and including committing suicide, that the group might survive. And there are some very interesting dis discussions on baboon and baboon behavior in uh, African Genesis. Uh, so that I think that what I'm trying to, uh, uh, to imply here is that man has a dual nature, pro predominantly uh, aggressive, but also recessively altruistic, if you'll accept that term. No, I won't accept that he has a dual nature. He basically has capacities beyond which we are willing to concede because we don't want to acknowledge our primitive condition. It's that uh, given a survival situation, you know, the man will perform truly. Uh, 
you know, white Americans don't have a survival threat except in terms of their possessions and how they identify with them. That's this is the you, whole you motivation that's pushing mainstream me. America is what Wait. they call the American way of life, what they call free enterprise, many things which have been so distorted already, you yes. know, by the political and economic forces in this country. You've just said that Malcolm X and other people are willing to lay down their lives for their brothers. But well, I didn't put the, it that way. For, I said they were, they were, they necessarily had to live the ideals <coughs> right. that they held to be important, whether or not I agree with they that. would be killed. And that's what I'm saying. That aspect, the, quali the quality... That's that, a single that nature. That wasn't a dual nature. Yes, but that same quality which existed in Malcolm X also existed in many, many men of all races. And Precisely does. my point before, oh, that really history, did. Western recorded history, chooses for very definite well, reasons to highlight well, certain of these instances where men live by their ideals in order to minimize, you see, solution. that this kind of life you know, is the vision that we should be moving towards. They make them into examples precisely so other people can say, well, it's unusual, it's a divine educator, that's God incarnated. You know, in other words, I'm not responsible All right, for so living so Western ideas. man is just as capable of making this sacrifice or this demonstrating this form of life as Malcolm X was. Malcolm was a Western man. Uh, he, okay, unfortunately, okay, okay. for you, he outgrew the Western mentality. Oh, and and it became much on. greater. Well, I mean, you have to face it, Lloyd. Mm -hmm. uh, the Western uh, mentality the is hung we're, up we're, in a materialistic yeah, but rat Maddie, race. We're not there is a, we're there not is a cleavage between Western here. religious concepts as, as expressed and yeah, the behavior. Yeah, we're not of talking about proponents of this. Yeah, we're not talking about culture. We're talking about man's behavior. Think, well, that's, that's his that's culture. What culture is. No. That's his time and place no. behavior. Culture Man, is man's time and no. place behavior. Man's behavior is predicated upon his genetic inheritance. Uh, which goes back 25 right, million but that, years. Right, that doesn't, you know, express the limitations that he has, and you're trying to oh, limit him to what his behavior has Oh, it certainly does limitations and also his potential. I am not limited to what Western civilization has projected upon the world. Yeah, but well, no, how do, one how said that. no one said that. How do you that. see a, a I, opening up the, uh, this potential? You said you may be limited by your biological mm -hmm. heritage. You're limited by your biological heritage. But this heritage. has not right. been demonstrated in behavior because you don't know the capacity. And the whole history of technology. What do you mean we don't know the capacity? I think that throughout the history of, the recorded history of man, which is some 4,000 years, we have demonstrated practically the potential of man, from Michelangelo down to the street cleaner. We who? We, man. man. Even the Western Hopi Indians, I mean, when yeah, you throw in... Yeah, the Hopi in, Indians, the are, Japanese, the, uh, the Africans. We have well, demonstrated a behavior, but I am not convinced that we have exhausted our potential. Oh, no one says... Nor have, no one nor says, have we clearly yeah, visualized we have, our We have potential. demonstrated a very high... Uh, uh, Demonstration of reality, 99% or no, 90%. No, I say it's been a very primitive demonstration up to this with point. Beethoven? Yes, with we, Beethoven? Yes, with Beethoven. How do we open and, uh, the potential? I mean, you know, how can you work Well, all right, I'm not, I'm not proposing. How do, how do, how do, how do we remove Beethoven these barriers to this potential? Yeah, and James Brown, Stevie Wonder. I okay, mean, Beethoven okay. can't touch Stevie Wonder. Well, uh, that's Beethoven's a subjective evaluation. Father was a mulatto. <laughs> but I'm saying within the generations I mean, of men since recorded history, we have individuals who have... Uh, who have performed in extreme manners and have thereby demonstrated a potential of, hum of human beings, which is potential to all human beings. Well, I, had, I, I, I resist your describing this as extreme because then it gets to be something un well, accessible to the... No, no, unusual. I think I Beethoven was unusual that. and I think Malcolm well, X was unusual. Well, that was a technical skill in combination with a talent. And well, we all right, it's part of human very potential. Specific, yeah, that's a, that's a specific thing. All right, it's part of human thing. potential. And we're talking about human potential and man's behavioral characteristic and what is man's potential. And all man's right, let's talk about what is the potential. All right, man's potential is demonstrated, I think, by a visualization of man's performance for the last 2,000 years and that's before. That's his past. That's not his potential. I'm saying that his potential is far greater than his it past may as well be. It may I'm well saying be. that it has to be. And even in the past, I think there it may are well indications have to be, of our potential. Then let's, let's get on and create that All right. You know, okay. Kind of so now how do we get on? But we first must, we must start on getting on with an understanding of what we are. If we just try to do it on wishful thinking, and dreaming, Maddie, we're going to fail, and somebody's going to push the button. What do you mean wishful Lloyd, thinking and dreaming? Just in, that. In, in terms of understanding what we are, there is one approach, which is the biologically limited approach. Mm -hmm. There are other approaches, and uh, I'd like to hear from, from Judah, who has expressed another approach, how he sees removing some of the barriers to potential, because I think uh, to, to open up the potential for this diversity, because I think we've got some choices to make, and 
we, we need to question, you know, how, on what basis we make these choices. Well, one of the and, things that comes to mind, I don't profess to say that it's an all-inclusive answer by any means, but is the role of, of uh, symbols and ritual in society. Uh, we tend to be, in, in this day and age, rather iconoclastic. Uh, we tend to dislike symbols and ritual and things shouldn't be ritualistic. I think that's less because uh, we are capable of doing without the symbols and that we've lost a, an understanding of their meaning. Right. Uh, I sort of view symbols and rituals often as the poetry of life, which have the ability at various times when we are faced with uh, situations that perhaps remind us of this problem, by engaging in the symbolic act or the ritual act, it calls it to mind enough to bring it to consciousness so that we are in the daily routine, I'm not talking about right. on a once a year basis, but in daily routine, we cover the take the biological act or fact and try and convert it uh, into something else. The act of eating can be converted beyond simply the act of mm -hmm. killing an animal and uh, digesting what you mm -hmm. found. It can be made into a, an expression somehow of a concern for life and, and for other human beings. Uh, in the same way, a, a day of rest, whether it be a Sunday or a Saturday, can be developed as a routine in the everyday working of man once a week out of the seven days when he withdraws from the competitiveness of the secular life to try and see his fellow man uh, in another context uh, uh, as another human being, not someone with whom he's in competition or against whom he's engaged in some form of battle. And I think really there is a need not for so much a return to ritual, I think the ritual is there to be found, or the symbols are there to be found, but to a better appreciation of what their function is and, and what their meaning Would is. Would you agree, oh, Jude, that it's not that we've just lost these, but that they've been deliberately supplanted by other kinds of things that crop up in our entertainment, in our so-called recreation, that we've been deliberately diverted I would agree from the that. meaningful continuum of humanity and a common search for nobler ways of life We've been diverted into the whole body worshiping culture, which says that we've reached some epitome and we call it a standard of living and isn't it great and how do we export it uh, when we really should be saying, you know, have we really left the caves, which we agreed in earlier that we hadn't, and what is it that we should be seeking? And I say it's the wholeness, which you mentioned before, because this is where I feel the balance is meaningful, not in a standard or static or any economic definition, but in a dynamics, you see, of interacting between passive and aggressive and between all the multiplicity of capacities uh, that we have, which is why I go to, if, if territorial rights, you know, I mean, territorial imperative is real, then so are squatters right. How do we begin to create the kind of balance so that man, in his aggression, you know, has outlets that don't deny his passive uh, yes. desires yeah. too. Well, that's, a, that's bring a point that I, I think these two points here, are there, are there, and one of the, um, uh, the role of religion you know, also, and the point that you're making here, uh, I think that one of the things that we need I is a return to, uh, I think we can take a leaf out of the book of some of the so-called more primitive religions. And I think that one of the functions of, one of the things that we need is uh, ways of blowing off steam, ways of getting rid of a lot of our aggressive impulses that are built up. And of course, one of the things, one of the things I think almost all of us would agree upon, whether or not aggression is innate or not, is that frustration tends to make people aggressive. Frustration of other drives tends to make you aggressive. I think whether or not this is innate or learned, whatever. And that one of the things we need are ways of blowing off steam. And I, I think, although um, the, this, uh, some people might not take this very seriously, that uh, religion might seriously look at some of the, the uh, older religions in which uh, orgies were, a, organized orgies were a way, were a, a regular way of life, a way of really blowing off steam. When people got together and really let themselves go, they danced until they fell on the ground. They got drunk or they used other drugs to, to release themselves. They had sexual experiences. They let themselves go. go. They blew their minds. But Bruce, I think they we're so you closed in. See, we're so uptight. And this is one way, I think, one place where um, but religion But the motivation of those people was not to blow off steam. It was to relate to their God or to do something meaningful which came to us through the symbols well, and rituals. It had the so function again, of the blowing reason off we steam. have the need yeah. to blow off steam is because we really have no meaningful relationship to a universal context 
you know, we're isolated lumps of clay, and that's why you talk about blowing off steam. But if you uh, have a meaningful relationship to the universe and you interact, you know, with each other, with your environment, and with what you visualize as, as the intelligent force that controls all this and seeks the balance, that comes out in a ritual or, you know, a discipline. And so I would prefer what Jude says to begin to go back and recover the meanings rather than to just blow off steam, which is why we've got the false, you know, kinds of things for entertainment and recreation, precisely because they permit us to blow off steam, but they, they don't. don't let they us don't. understand. Well, They're yes, passive. they do. Yes, Almost they do. all our forms of entertainment I know, are passive. but that's the kind of steam we've got now, which is why... You don't blow off steam totally when you're passive in entertainment. Values, you see, where, where the, once again, the majority of the concepts of what is good and right and what we ought to do are not followed, are not practiced, and are in, con in contradiction to the value of fighting for territory, property, aggressiveness, et cetera. Uh, and I think that it's a failure to really deal with and develop basic human values that are, in, that are supportive of human needs as we see them now, not going back to uh, look at animal needs, and, but to look at human needs, the need for survival, the need for uh, uh, for for light, air, food, shelter, and all of what charge aggressive developed. impulses and truth. Uh, <laughs> the aggressive impulses, I would I would maintain, are responses to frustration of these basic human needs, right. which I'll come back right. to again, which right. are our food and I would beyond certainly agree with it. and it increases beyond, them. But. Right and beyond food, shelter, and so on, the need for human interaction, relationship, love, God, as Maddie would. Uh, describe it. Uh, I, I just don't think that, that you can uh, simply justify or explain behavior that we see now uh, that, that I would consider to be responses to the situation as innate human traits. That we right. should change the situation and right. after we've removed all these barriers, you show me that man's a, a, a innate aggressive behavior remaining, then I, I might go yeah, along. I think that, that it's, the job is much too great and the time much too short to simply to blow off the steam. Uh, uh, I much prefer your earlier approach that if we've got this steam, rather than simply blow it off and dissipate it, that we try and channel it ways. into some positive approach. That's right. why you know, your concept of the orgy, I'd much rather convert that orgy into some positive expression, such right. as, for example, uh, the concept that's becoming increasingly popular in, in the Catholic Church uh, of, of a type of dinner, you know, that to symbolize the last dinner, or, or in Judaism, the Passover ceremony, right, where you take that same, perhaps, approach of, of trying to to act in a group and to do something, and yet at the same time you try and channel it in such a way that it has a new meaning which takes you another step it's, further. It sounds too civilized to me. Yeah, we, need, no. we need ways of blowing off steam in primitive ways because we have primitive impulses and if we sit around uh, with our coats and ties on and so forth, and, and we're not we're not going to really blow off. But Bruce, we're not no, going to lose our primitive impulses. We're going to evolve, you know, other impulses. levels of characteristics. Right, there are other ways of channeling, and yeah. I agree that you, you so can it's not channel. Either or. What there are ways you can attack not only other human beings; you can attack problems. But you can stop the orientation of attack. You see, you can begin to our internalize and this, use yeah. and and create. You see, when when you even when you say channel. Uh, steam or energy, you don't really, you mean use it, you see? Channel means something you do to somebody else. Again, it's imposing or opposing, you know, but I'm saying each of us must be that conscious element which tunes in on, you know, the constructive phase of the creation that's going yeah. on rather than the that's destructive fine. phase, which is what we're oriented to because we're in a decadent society. Well, that's fine, and I, th I and think, we I hope we, sh we can direct our aggressive impulses towards uh, problems rather than towards people. But I, I think until we arrive at the stage where we've removed all of our aggressions, I think in the meantime it would be a good idea to have ways of uh, blowing off steam, the things as I all have right. suggested. I think this would be well, very... Well, let me say, where we are um, your solutions to, to this? What, what, I, well, I'd, I'd like, like to hear again. I haven't really heard any proposals We're all going to different the levels, interestingly yeah. enough, and a lot of this is semantics because, to my ear, I think all of us have a very common agreement on our objectives. We all, would, we all aspire to the, simply the peaceable kingdom uh, now. The question is how to get there. Now, shut up, Maddie. <laughs> well, I'm not aspiring to the peaceful kingdom. Well, all right. Well, let's Leave escalate it be for a moment. I hope here. the audience understands what I'm trying to transmit yes. here. Um, now, 
I believe, as I've said before, that we are biologically and innately aggressive with an underlying strong in indication or uh, effort toward uh, altruism. I think that the society that we develop in the future must take cognizant of this natural nature of man, and I think that our society should be one wherein the aggressive aspects of our nature would be penalized after a point, and I think that the altruistic aspects of our nature should be rewarded also after a point. Now, I'm saying here, I'm not saying here, this gets down to the free enterprise system and, and economics and our legal structure, and I think that uh, the American system of free enterprise is, within certain limits, terribly desirable as a format for social organization. But I think the American free enterprise system, as it presently has evolved, uh, needs very, very major adjustments if the American society is going to survive. I think, for example, that a step which would guarantee income to a minimum income to all people would tend to relieve much of the frustrations which is now felt in the poorer classes and tend to relieve some of the aggression in that particular area. I also feel equally strongly that there should be a ceiling imposed where it, at which nobody in this country could acquire more than a given amount of wealth. Uh, I think there is a, a much too high concentration of wealth. In fact, I think something like one million people in the United States out of 200 million own something like 35 percent of the investment capital in this country. And this kind of thing is, is extremely dangerous to our society and, in fact, in, in the long run will destroy it. So that if a man can gain a certain given quantity of dollars uh, having uh, used his free enterprise techniques, then I think efforts beyond that should, be reward, should, should uh, develop rewards for altruistic pursuits, like, for example, the, general, the president of General Motors or some such symbolic man having gained an income of X dollars a year would not be allowed to get more than that. But would be rewarded by some other method if he devoted his excess energies to some sort of an altruistic purpose, such as running a hospital or doing something for the good of man. And who would limit him? How, what, in, in other words, are you expecting this 1% then to suddenly at some point altruistically deny the territorial imperative, which is their major, uh, I, I think, a supportive kind of philosophy for, for people who already have property and territory. You think that you ex that these this one percent will deny the territorial imperative and say no, they're not here, gonna uh, hey, spread it around? No, sir. You're going to have to fight tooth and claw to get it away from them, I'll tell you that. And the reason why they've got it is because they and their forebears, plus a good element of chance, has made them or has proved to be, they have proved to be the most successful predators in the jungle. Well, how uh, does this square with Christianity, which uh, I don't I think, think it does at all. I don't Anglo think it does at all. But I think Christianity uh, is a beautiful, wishful thinking, uh, and including Judaism to the extent that I understand it. And I'm not going to say that I do understand it, but I think that this type of wishful thinking is the kind of thing that's leading us down the garden path to oblivion. That Christianity is the kind of wishful thinking which will. What is your response? Well, I, I agree with all the proposals. Thank you.